All right, if I have a Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter number 6. Now, before I preach, let me make the same disclaimer. If anything I say that's different than what the pastor teaches, I'm wrong. He's right, okay? Now, uh, pastor wants me to preach uh, this evening because he wants to hear me preach. I was thinking he can just go to my YouTube channel and hear something from there. But anyway, I- I'm great to have the opportunity to preach behind the pulpit. It's always great to proclaim God's word from the pulpit. Amen? Now, Hebrews chapter 6, let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now, in context... Paul is telling, Paul is, uh, Paul is teaching the Christians, we should not just stay with the principles of the doctrine, we should go on for some strong meat. We should go on to learn something else. You know, some Christians, when they read, when they, when they read the Bible every single day, they only read the book of Psalm, the book of Proverbs, but we should also read some dark sayings, some, do, some deep doctrines, you know, read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, read Daniel, read Revelation. We should, we should not stick to, to, to the to the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Otherwise, we will remain as a baby in Christ. We should be a seasoned Christian to consume some of the meat of the doctrine. Now, today, I want to focus on one of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Verse number 2, the Bible says, of the doctrine of baptism. So today, I'm going to talk about the sermon title is The Doctrine of Baptisms. Now, Paul is admonishing Christians to go higher, to go on to perfection, but some people only want to find some new things. But when Christians always want to seek for the new things, they end up going to heresies. Sometimes we need to renew what's, what's been taught. We want to renew what the foundation of our faith is. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now, some people may think, you know what baptism is. You, you don't need the sermon. But that's not the case. You know, if you have not be, been baptized, this sermon is for you. But if you have been baptized, this sermon is also for you as a refreshment. For, for example, if I preach uh, to the men, to the elder women about abortion, it might not apply to you personally, but, but it can be doctrinal. You can teach other people. You can teach your wife. You can teach younger women. So even if the sermon does not apply to you personally, it can also be a good doctrine for you to know. Okay? Now, you are in Philippians chapter 3. Let me read from you Hebrew chapter 2, verse number 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So even if you have heard the doctrine of baptisms over and over again, it is still safe for you to hear about that. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Notice the next phrase. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. It is safe for you to hear the same thing over and over again. It is safe for you to hear uh, salvation is by grace through faith over and over again. It is safe for you to hear about the eternal security of the believers over and over again. Right. Because we should stick with the, with the foundation and then we should go on to perfection. You know, try to be knowledgeable, not just go to church, but also have our own devotion. You know, read other books of the Bible. Try to pray, try to ask God to direct you, to teach you. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. So today I want to talk about the doctrine of baptisms. Now, right off the bat, I want to make a statement. We don't need to be baptized to be saved. The Bible is clear. Not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So preach the gospel and getting baptized are two different things. We should not believe in the heresy called the baptismal regeneration. You know, salvation is only by grace through faith. So what is baptism? The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, look at verse number 4. Romans 6, verse number 4, the Bible says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So in this passage, it's talking about the symbol, because we are not literally buried with Christ. Because baptism symbolizes we are being buried with Christ. We are being dumped into the water. And as Christ rose up from the, de- from, from the dead, we also rise up from the water. So the baptism is a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Number two, why should we get baptized? Why should we get baptized? If getting baptized 
does not save you, then why should we do that? You know, a very famous verse, Matthew 28, look at verse number 19. Matthew 28, go be therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, of the Father and, the, and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So the Bible says the Great Commission contains three parts. First, teaching all nations, teaching them about the gospel, get people saved, and then baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So getting baptized, why should we do that? It's God's command. That's how we should do that. We should strive to follow all commands. So, why should we do it? It's a sign of obedience unto Christ. Because Christ was baptized, not because he needs to wash what he's saying, not because he's sinful, but because as an obedience unto God the Father. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. It's like putting on the wedding ring, okay? If you are married, if you, are, if you don't put on, on the ring, you are still married. But... You know, we should not be ashamed to proclaim we are God's children. You no, know, baptism simply symbolizes you are a Christian. It's a public testimony among believers showing you have been saved. Okay, so so if you are saved and you have never been baptized, you should baptize right away, putting on the re- putting on the wedding ring. Because I'm not ashamed. You know, for the gospel of Christ, for the power unto God, for the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. As Christians, we should not be ashamed to proclaim our faith. Same thing goes on with soul winning. Same thing goes along with, 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 with contending with the common salvation. You know, same thing with we should, we should strive to stick with the King James Bible. We should not be ashamed to proclaim our faith. We should not be ashamed to, to do the first work, you know, to follow Christ's first step to be baptized. So, so I talk about what is baptism, number two, why should we get baptized, number three, when should we get baptized? When should we get baptized? You are in Acts chapter 8, look at verse number 36. Acts chapter 8, verse 36, the Bible says, Now, here's the passage talking about the Ethiopian eunuch, okay? Verse 36, the Bible says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What that hinder me to be baptized? So basically, the, the, the eunuch is saying, what stops me to be baptized? You know, what stops me, what hinders me to be baptized? Verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So the answer is, when should we get baptized? Right after salvation. You know, so because, because the Philip is, is, is asking Philip, you know, what stops me to be baptized? Here's water. What stops me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest, thou mayest. So, so, so why, so when should we get baptized? Right after salvation. We should not wait. You know, some people just, just, just get it all wrong. Some people think you have to learn something about the Bible. Some people think you have to learn about the Ten Commandments. You have to have a general understanding with the Bible. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we should get baptized right after salvation. Go to Acts 16. Acts chapter number 16. Acts 16, look at verse number 30. Now now the context is talking about the prison guard getting saved from Paul and Silas. Acts 16, verse 30, the Bible says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them, pay attention, the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straight away. So, so the prison guard and, and his family, they were saved, and the same night, the same hour of the night, they were baptized right away. They were baptized straight away. Okay, so sometimes no, it's biblical to baptize, to baptize people in the middle of the night because that's right after salvation, okay? So according to the biblical principle, we should get baptized right after salvation, not wait six months, not, not, not taking a, a three-week course on baptism. The water is not that, that deep, folks. And we should not be trained. You know, some, some church I go to literally have a baptism class. They train people, but that's not what the Bible says. You know, we should get baptized right after 
salvation. Go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. So I talk about what is baptism. Number two, why should we get baptized? Number three, when should we get baptized? Number four, how should we get baptized? How should we get baptized? Now, now it's funny that you know, the word bapt- baptize literally means to immerse. That's why we don't believe in sprinkling babies you know, like the Catholics do. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Matthew 3 verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway, notice the next phrase, out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So throughout the Bible, every time when people were baptized, they were coming out of the water. Okay, so we don't believe in dipping, we don't believe in sprinkling, because the Bible gave us that the, Jesus Christ was baptized from inside the water and come out of the water. Okay, go to Acts chapter 8. Go back to Acts chapter 8. And also, if, if being baptized is a symbol of the burial and resurrection of Christ, being, be, being sprinkled does not symbolize that. Okay, that's why we should immerse, you know, it's a full immersion under the water, and then you come out, symbolize the resurrection. Okay, now the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, look at verse number 38. Acts 8, verse 38, the Bible says, And he, Philip, commanded the chariot to stand still, and they, notice that, went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him, and when they will come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went down his way rejoicing. So throughout the Bible, you can see the principle. People are going down into the water, and they come out, out of the water. So nowhere, nowhere in the Bible, you know, mention about sprinkling. You know, mention about infant baptism, because they don't even believe. You know, they don't, some people, they don't even have the knowledge of good and evil. And that's why babies go to heaven when they die, because people have no knowledge, so why are you baptizing an infant if they are not saved in the first place? So we should follow the biblical principle of baptism, okay? Now go to First Thessalonians chapter number 2. First Thessalonians chapter number 2. So I talk about number 1, what is baptism? Number 2, why should we get baptized? Number 3, when should we get baptized? Number 4, how should we get baptized? Now... Number five, I want to talk about some application for soul winners. Some application for soul winners. Because most of the time, when people go soul winning, they get people saved, and they leave them, just, just see ya. But, but, getting, but we should fulfill the Great Commission, right? right. There are three parts of the Great Commission, you know, teaching them you know, about the Gospel, baptizing them, and you know, to, to teach them about the Bible, disciple them, teach them to observe all things. So if you get people saved at, at the door, don't stop there, you know. So, some people share the gospel with the Romans road. You know, I have what I call the baptism road. Because every time I get people saved, I don't stop there. You know, I, so, because, because I always ask that person, have you been baptized before? Like, well, what do you know about baptism? Just, just show them what the Bible says about baptism. Encourage them to come to church and get baptized. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 8, the Bible says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, notice, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because it were dear unto us. So Paul is instructing uh, the Thessalonians, you know, he, shared the, he, he shared not the gospel of God only, but he also gave his life for them. He also gave his time, his energy for them. So when we share the gospel, we should not just share the gospel, get people saved, we should not stop there. We should invest our time, invest our life, because they were dear unto us, because they are our spiritual children. You know, when you when you give birth to a child, you don't you don't, you don't leave them alone. You, know, you feed them, you care for them, you spend time with them. You know, you instruct them step by step. So Paul says, you no, know, we are willing to impart unto you not the gospel, of, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. So when you get people saved, you know, the, you know the question I always ask is. Have you been baptized before? Do you know what baptism means? And then the scripture I always show them is Romans, uh, yes, Acts chapter 8. 
Philip said, no, that the eunuch said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Telling them, the Bible says, being baptized is a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection, and we should get baptized after getting saved. Now, most of the time, the person will tell you, I've been baptized when I was a kid. I've been baptized you know, when, I, when I was a teenager. But then I would always tell them, the Bible says we should, we should get, get baptized after saved. When, when do you get saved? And, and they will say, just now. And then, and then I will tell them, that means we should get baptized after today. You know, so, you, so we should also teach about baptism after salvation. Don't get any people saved and leave them right there. You know, we should also um, try to fulfill all three steps of the Great Commission. Talking about Bible reading, talk about church attendance, you know, talk about getting things out, out of their life, talk about baptism. Because you know, we should try to follow you know, Christ's first step. We should fulfill all three steps of the Great Commission. We should not just you know, contend with, with getting people saved. You know, we, can, we can show off with all, with all these salvation numbers, but have you invested your life, your time, your energy you know, for, for, for these people? Now go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So I talk about what is baptism. You know, why should we get baptized? When should we get baptized? And how should we get baptized? How should we get Baptized. Now let me address some objections of biblical doctrine of baptisms. Because some people think we should get baptized to be saved. You know, I mean a lot of people in the Church of Christ they they they, they, they believe that sort of work salvation. So so now I'm I'm going to bring up some some troublesome verses and, and just uh, Teach you how, how how you can how you can put these verses in context and address you know the, these principles. Now, now the principle of Bible study is if there are twenty clear verses that tells you salvation is by grace through faith, and if there's one verse that looks like it is teaching you you have to do works to be saved, chances are you are misunderstanding that one verse because there's no contradiction in the Bible. Does that make sense? If if there are a lot of verses teaching you clear verses in context, teaching you salvation is by grace through faith. And if there's one verse that looks like it's you have to do works, chances are you're misunderstanding that one verse. You know, we should always go with a clear scripture, not go with the parables. The parables can support clear scripture, but we should, also, we should always base our, our doctrine on clear verses. No, no dark things, okay? Now, now the first verse... The Church of Christ always want to bring up is Acts 2.38. Let's, let, let's look at it. Acts 2.38, the Bible says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. See? Baptized for the remission of sins. Okay? We should get baptized to get saved. Now, what does the word for mean? If I tell you, Someone is wanted for murder. Because they have committed murder, they are wanted, right? So if you just put that into practice, you know, we should, we should get, get baptized, every one of you, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. The verse says nothing about in order to get forgiveness of sin. It says, because you have the forgiveness of sins and then get baptized, the Bible says we should get baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the remission of sins, because you already have that. Right. Because the word for simply means to because. It doesn't mean in order to get something, okay? Now, now, other people believe you have to get baptized to get the Holy Ghost. Now, we know in order to get the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, all we have to do is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But this verse looks like... It, it teaches you, you receive the gift of, of the Holy Ghost by baptizing. But that's not what, what, the, what the verse says. Notice the Bible says, repent and be baptized. Notice that phrase, every one of you. Is that singular or plural? Singular, right? Every one of you is, pl is singular phrase, right? Everyone is here. We, we don't say everyone are here. So the phrase, every one of you, is singular phrase. But notice the next phrase. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ye is singular or plural. It's a plural pronoun, right? So, which means this phrase, ye shall receive the Holy Ghost, can only go after one clause before that. 
if every one of you baptize every one of you is a singular clause, then ye shall receive the Holy Ghost, cannot follow after that clause. So how do you see that verse? So the only way is repent is talking to the multitude, it's talking about the, the plurality. Repent and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not be baptized every one of you and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If that phrase is modifying be baptized every one of you, then the Bible, then, then the Bible should say he or she shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because you know, every one of you is a singular phrase and ye is plural pronoun, okay? So we know the only way to receive the gift, you know, God will give us every one of you the gift according to his grace. You know, right after salvation. And we're going to be, be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now go to Mark 16. Mark 16. Mark 16. Yeah, this verse is true. We should get baptized because we are saved. Because we have already received the forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins. Mark 16. Let's look at verse number 15. Mark 16, verse... Verse 15, the Bible says, And he, Jesus, said unto them, the apostles, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. See, we have to get baptized to be saved. <laughs> now, notice that the Bible, the Bible does not say, If you are not baptized, thou shalt be damned. It says, If thou believest not, shall be damned, right? Now, if I say, he that believeth in the gospel shall be saved. Is that right? Of course. If I say, he that believeth the gospel and I read my Bible shall be saved. Is that right? Of course. If I believe and also read my Bible, of course I'm saved. You know, so you can, you can substitute the phrase, is baptized with every work you can do. You know, he that believeth and go to church or shall be saved. And he that believeth and, and, and go soul winning shall be saved. That also makes sense. You know, because, because, because the parallel phrase says nothing about he that believeth, he that baptized not is then. It only says he that believeth not is then. And also, if you believe and you go to church, that, like, like all of you, you are saved, right? So if you really put this verse in context, it, it teaches nothing about baptis baptismal regeneration. Again, we should always go with clear verses. Salvation is by grace through faith. Go to Acts Chapter number 22, Acts 22. Now, now, this is a big one you know, from the Church of Christ crowd. Acts 22 is, is the conversion of Apostle Paul by the soul winner, and the, by the soul winner um, Ananias. The Bible says in Acts 22, verse 16, Acts 22, verse number 16, And now, why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. See, you have to get baptized to wash away thy sins. Now, here's the problem. If you just know a, lot, a little about grammar, I can't believe I'm a Chinese, I'm teaching English grammar. But anyway, but, so notice that the phrase, wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. The calling is the ing form, so, right? So this phrase is modifying the previous clause. It's like the calling on the name of the Lord is describing the previous clause. So how do you wash away thy sins? Calling on the name of the Lord. So getting baptized and wash away thy sins are two different things. Because calling is a, is a modifying phrase, modifying the previous clause to wash away thy sins. So how do you wash away thy, thy sins? By calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? So if you just know simply about you know, the grammar or, or the totality of the Bible in context, the Bible is pretty clear. You know, we should... The only way to get saved is by calling on the name of the Lord, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. Now this is a tough one. First Peter chapter three. Let's look at verse number eighteen. First Peter three verse eighteen. The Bible says in First Peter chapter three verse number eighteen, for Christ also had once suffered for sins, for for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering the long -suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was uh, preparing, wherein field that his eight souls saved, were saved by the water, 
verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not a putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, even baptism does also now save us. See, you should get baptized to be saved. Now, here's the problem. First, the word being saved does not always mean spiritual salvation. It could mean you, you are saved by water, you are saved by a fireman, you are being saved by someone else, right? right. Now, uh, the other way, yes, the word baptism does not always mean water baptism. Right. You know, we know that we know the earth was baptized, was baptized by the Noah's ark, by the Noah's flood, not Noah's ark. <laughs> by the way, we, we, uh, we were just uh, at the Noah's ark uh, yesterday. Uh, it, it, it was great. <laughs> by the way, it, um, there's no flood there, so. But the thing is. The word baptism does not always mean water baptism. No, we know that when, when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the Bible says they were, they were baptized unto Moses. They are in reference to Moses. You know, eventually, the earth, everything will be baptized by fire. You know, talking about in the end time, talking about the wrath of God. You know, and then, and then, and then at the day of Pentecost, believers were baptized by the Holy Ghost. So the word baptized does not always mean water baptism. Okay? Now, how do we deal with that verse? Even baptism does also now save us. Now, I come up with two interpretations. Number one, the Bible says in verse 21, the like, the like figure. Now, figure means a symbol, right? Figure does not mean it's literal. The Bible says the like figure, we're unto even baptism does now save us. So this baptism could mean it, it, it's just a symbol of salvation, just symbol of the death, burial, and and resurrection, but the Bible also, but the Bible also clarified that in the parenthesis, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, one interpretation is here: the baptism is a symbol, not the putting away of, of, of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a, of a good conscience. Some people believe, you know, it's just the answer of, of a good conscience. It's, it's just response. To God's command, it's just a, it's just a public profession because baptism is a public profession of faith, right? Answer of a good conscience, you know, toward God. Now, the other interpretation is here: the word baptism simply is mean a spiritual baptism. Simply means we believe on Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says in Colossians chapter two, we are being buried with Him in baptism, not because we are physically buried with Him, but it's a symbol. So we, we can go both ways without, without teaching the, the, the heresy, we should get baptized to be saved. You know, but I believe here the baptism is a symbol of, of salvation. Go, go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. So because the word saved does not always mean being saved from hell, the word baptism does not always mean being, being baptized by water. Now here in Luke chapter 12, we see uh, Christ, uh, try Christ, give you a statement in Luke chapter 12, verse number 50. Luke 12, verse 50, the Bible says, But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Now, here's the thing. Christ has been water baptized by John the Baptist at the beginning of, of, his, of his ministry, right? Now this is towards the end of his ministry. The Bible says, Jesus Christ says, But I have a baptism to be baptized with. What is he talking about? It's not water baptism, okay? The word baptism simply means to emerge, to bury, to, to, to put under. This is talking about Jesus Christ's death. The Bible says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, if you put this verse together, it's talking about the death, burial, and, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here, the word baptism simply means death. He's going to bury, you know, and, and, I know, under the tomb, right? Makes sense? Because we know that Christ was water baptized by John the Baptist at the beginning of his ministry, because the word baptized, the word baptized simply means to submerge, you know, to cover under, okay? Now, go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, look at verse number 5. John chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse number 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's actually interesting. Every time 
the people who are teaching you have to get baptized to be saved, every time they, they see they, they see the word water, they get all they get all hyped up. You know, the water save us. But if you really put that in context, notice this verse says nothing about getting baptized and be saved. It says being born of water. Okay. Now. Some people think we should be being born of water and of the Spirit to be saved. We have to get baptized and trust in Christ to be saved. Now, here's the problem. The Bible is its own dictionary. Look at, the, look at the next verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Notice that these two verses are parallel. What does it mean to be born of water? It means to be born of the flesh. And be born of the Spirit means to be born of the Spirit. If you connect these two verses in context, the Bible tells you what, what that means. So being born of water simply means, you know, being born physically. You know, have you heard about the phrase, the water broke? Talking about the physical birth, okay? Now, the Bible says in John chapter 6, it, it is a spirit that quickens the, the flesh profiteth nothing. Okay, so of course, this being born of water is connecting to being born of the flesh. We should, all, we should always see the, see the Bible in context. It's actually interesting. Every false doctrine has, has a Bible verse in that. Even, right. even the baptism of the dead, you know, talk, you know, pre preached by the Mormons, has a Bible verse. But if you put that in context, Paul is rebuking these people because they don't believe in the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you just put this verse in context, it's actually proving against their false doctrine. Okay. Now go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm almost done. Just to give you some more verses. We know that this is Sunday night. We have, we have a more um, serious crowd. We we're just going to do a little Bible study. Hebrews chapter 10. Now while you're turning there, let, let me read from you um, the book of the book we the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, again, this, this verse is easy. You know, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, by the word of God. We should be cleansed every day. And we should be washed by the water through the word of God every single day. Okay? So, so, so don't see the word water you, you just link that to baptism, okay? Simply, sometimes water can be a type, can be a symbol of something else. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, the Bible says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and, and our bodies washed with pure water. Here you go, sprinkling, you know, Catholics. Now here's the problem. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling. You know, we are being saved by the blood of Christ. You know, Jesus Christ has, has sprinkled His blood upon the mercy seat. Okay? If you just see the whole Bible in context, it teaches nothing about baptismal regeneration. You might, you might ask, what about our bodies washed with pure water? I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but, but actually... Um, um, so I was, I was thinking about that verse, uh, so I was cross-referencing the, the Old Testament, talking about Aaron and then his sons, they were being washed by the water, you know, they are being anointed, so I think that might connect to the Old Testament. But if you really see the totality of the scripture, it teaches nothing about baptismal re regeneration. The only way to be saved is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Now, go to Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, chapter 5, my bad, Galatians chapter number 5. We will look at two passages and, and, and we will close the sermon. Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. Look at verse number 1. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 1. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 verse number 1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be now entangled again with the yoke of bondage, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, Paul is instructing uh, the people that some people, they, they think they, they, they can do works and to be, to be justified by Christ. And Paul says... Those people is a debtor to do the whole law. 
Because if you break one law, you, know, you, are, you are falling from grace. If you think you can justify you know, your position through your works, you, know, you are falling from grace. But notice that in verse number 2, the Bible says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You, know, you can basically switch, switch that phrase to, to anything you do. That if you be baptized, Christ shall profit you nothing. That if we read your Bible, Christ shall profit you nothing, because the only way to be justified, to be under God's grace, is by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in Him fully. Not trying to live a Christian life through your own understanding. No, certainly not to trying to go to heaven by circumcision, by the letters of the law, trying to get baptized. You know, you are a debtor to you, the whole law. You know, you are fallen from grace. But in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, so, most of you here have been baptized, okay? So, so, how can we apply that to our personal life? Now, every time we share the gospel, people, people will, will start accusing us, you are those once saved, always saved crowds. You, know, you are those people who believe in once saved, always saved. But here, here's my problem. The people will call Christians at Antioch bad enemies. You know, because we are, we are not ashamed to put on, put on a title on it. You know, we are independent Baptists. No, we are fundamental, we are old-fashioned, biblically, okay? We're not trying to be old-fashioned to be old-fashioned, we are trying to stick with the Bible. You know, I call myself a biblicist. If the Bible says it, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to do it, no matter how unpopular that is. So the phrase, once saved, always saved, I believe that, because it clarifies everything, okay? Because the gift of Christ is eternal life. Now, some people think, think does that mean you can do whatever you want to do? Now, the Bible actually tells us, Romans 6, verse number 1. What well, shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Which means if we sin, grace will abound. The Bible says, you know, uh, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But shall we? God forbid. Which means even if we sin, we are still covered by God's grace because we are once saved, always saved. But shall we? God forbid. You know, but then notice that the, the next verse, verse number three, talks about knowing not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we were, are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So what does baptism really symbolize? It symbolizes we are saved. It symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection. It symbolizes we should mortify our old, old man and live with the new man. So here's what, what is applied to you. You might be, you might, you might be baptized, but you might, you might walk a, a fleshly, a carnal life. You, know, you should look back to your baptism. What does that, what does that symbolize? You know, we should put away our old man. We should try to uh, strive against our flesh. Because when we get saved, our flesh is still the old flesh. Only our spirit has been regenerated, right? You know, God has saved our soul not our flesh. This, this flesh will eventually go away. It's gonna, you know, Christ is going, is going to give us an incorruptible body. So as Christians, you know, just like baptism is a symbol of the death of Christ, and just like Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father, we should live in glory. You know, we should live in newness of life. We should not live uh, in, in the oldness, in, in the oldness of, of the letter. You know, we should realize that our old man is crucified. Our old man is buried with Christ. You know, baptism is a symbol. It's a symbol. So we should destroy the body of sin. We should mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. You know, it's like Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. We should mortify our members, fornication and cleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We should mortify our body. As, as Paul said, we should die daily. We should bear the cross daily. Because, it, because we have to realize we are saved, and I've been baptized. You know, I know that this symbolizes my old man has been buried with Christ. So, so if, you, if you have not been baptized, you should get baptized. 
right away. You know, talk to pastor. You know, he'll, he'll talk to you. If you're not saved, getting saved and get baptized. If you are baptized, maybe teach other people. Maybe you go soul winning. Maybe you teach other people who have never been baptized. Teach them about the doctrine of baptisms. And, and if you have done all this, examine yourself. Have you lived in the newness of life? Because baptism does not save you, but it does symbolize a new life. It symbolizes your old man. Hey, they are dead. Okay, we should always strive together to live a victorious Christian life. Again, as we say in the morning, the only way to have victory in Christ is to trust Him fully. You know, we trust in Him for salvation, but what about every aspect of your life? Just remember, you are, you are saved Christians, you have been baptized, and you are waiting for Christ to come again. Let's just live our life to the fullness and help reach the lost. Let's pray.